Get long measurements with the best, most durable tapes for commercial and industrial use. That means you, Adjuster. Use code ADJUSTERTV at checkout for a discount on anything at ustape.com. In this video, learn exactly what the best independent adjusters do to earn the big bucks, including getting started right, saving money, getting trained up, building relationships and networking, how long it really takes to start earning good money, and so much more. Starting now. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Download the remote work guide at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. And by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Eberl Claim Service. Get your career started right now at eberls.com and by the IA firm Crawford & Company. It's not too late to get early bird pricing on the 2022 Crawford Cat Conference at croco.com slash cat. Have you ever wished that you could prove to IA firms that you understand policy, construction, Xactimate, and customer service? We finally have the answer to this question, and this is a very special edition of Adjuster TV. We have a huge announcement about something we've been working on behind the scenes for a very long time in collaboration with IAPath.com, as well as the major IA firms. This is really, really, really big. So stay tuned until the end of this video to hear all about it. So what is an adjuster. Let's talk about kind of um, what adjusting, what, what adjusters are and what they are not and sort of distinguish ourselves from um, what the kind of the conventional wisdom of what an adjuster is. If you do a search on Google for insurance adjuster, you're going to see pretty much nothing but stuff about auto claims. Um, but for the purposes of adjuster TV, we do talk a little bit about auto claims, but on this channel, we talk about property claims, which are homeowners claims, commercial claims, et cetera, for buildings and houses and things like that, because that's what I did for 20 years. Um, so, and the difference between kind of what I was as an independent adjuster and a insurance adjuster who works directly for an insurance company is that for, in my case, um, if the insurance company has a, a really, really big um, weather event where there's a lot of damage, hailstorms, hurricanes, things like that, um, where they have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, claims all getting dropped into their laps within, you know, a day or two or three or a week. Um, they don't keep that the, the number of people on staff to handle that kind of a volume of claims. So they'll farm it out to third party companies who will come in and provide adjusters, provide a call center, provide, you know, support and everything else for those adjusters to help them, to help the insurance company handle all those claims. And the main reason is because they want to be, they want the homeowner, the policy owner, their the carriers, they want their customer um, to not have to sit there and wait for weeks for an adjuster to show up or to have something done over the phone or something kind of done, not to the fullest level of claims handling that they would expect if they're paying a lot of money for homeowners insurance or for, you know, for property insurance for their building. Um, so we're distinguished from like a, a insurance adjuster who works at an insurance company in that we are independent contractors for all intents and purposes. And we also get paid by the claim and we get a commission based what really kind of amounts to a, a commission on the claim. This is counterintuitive. It's not something that, that everybody knows about or that, that makes sense. And it's one of the reasons why this job is so can be can be so lucrative is that we get paid more the bigger the claim is in a lot of circumstances, in most circumstances, especially traditionally with a full uh, adjust, adjuster handling the, the full role that is contacting the homeowner, scoping the damage, making a coverage decision, negotiating with the contractor, settling up with the homeowner, so on and so forth. Um, so a $3,000 claim isn't going to pay as much as a $35,000 claim, right? Or a $60,000 claim. Um, so there's an incentive there for us as independent adjusters to find all the damage that we can um, and to, to write as good of a file as we can the first time so that we can maximize our earnings and maximize the, you know, the experience that the homeowner gets. They're going to get every, hopefully they're going to get everything taken care of 
the first time and not have to drag the process out, which is one of the complaints that people have about homeowners insurance. And rightfully so in a lot of cases, because you know not everybody does that. Um, so there are different types of adjusters. Um, for our purposes, generally speaking, we're talking about property, and property means homeowners, right? So if you live in the neighborhood and you have a, you own a house and you've got a mortgage, you're required to have homeowners insurance. Um, part of that homeowners insurance is coverage for your personal property, right? So the stuff that's inside the house. If you picked up the house and shook it out, everything that falls out of the house would would go into your personal property part of your coverage. Um, there's auto prop auto claims. Um, which for car accidents um, and things and hail damage and things like that, um, there is um, farm and ranch, right? Which is another kind of property uh, claim which may have coverage for, you know, farm equipment, um, all the buildings, different locations on the, the property. It may have, you know, may or may not have coverage for crop for the crops themselves. There is commercial, which is again, I mean, that's anything that. Any sort of a structure that's used for a business could be a, a house that's a rental property, could be a condo that's used as a rental property, um, could be a strip mall, it could be a regular mall if there's any of those left, uh, it could be a fast food restaurant. I've written claims on a McDonald's that had the all their signage and everything blasted out by hail. Those are great claims to get your hands on. Office buildings, anything that's that's a uh, you know uh, a commercially used structure, basically, right? Um, and again, like I mentioned, you know, there's condo claims, which, you know, condos are a little bit different than than uh, homeowners policies, and they're definitely different different from like a renter's policy because the condo owner of the unit owns the air inside the unit, and it may own the paint and the the floor covering, and they may own uh, as part of their what they own in that condo, they may own f you know finished surfaces, and maybe they own. Uh, the cabinets and things like that and appliances and stuff, or maybe they don't. It just depends on, and this is one of the reasons why condos get so complicated is that they're all different, right? And state to state, town to town, you know, association, association, the association, you know, there's a, there's an association that people have to pay their condo dues to that is a commercial policy, right? And that's going to be for the exterior of the building. It's going to be for the framing, the electrical, the plumbing, and all that, the structural stuff, landscaping around the building and things like that. Um, so you can get a commercial uh, claim that's a like a fourplex condo unit that's an association by itself. Or there, maybe there's 20 buildings and they're all fourplexes. Um, if you get that, then you're only going to be dealing with the outside of the building and you're going to be dealing with whoever the... Um, uh, representative is from the condo association. Whereas if you had all the individual, like they had a fire, like a nearby wildfire and everybody got smoke in their unit and you got all those claims, then you would be dealing with individual unit owners, right? So those are kind of, it's kind of different. So condo claims can be very, very lucrative. They're complex. And I always kind of recommend that people try to get to know them um, because not everybody wants to do condo claims. And if, you, if you're the person who's like, yeah, you know what, I know condos inside and out, or I want to know condos inside and out, um, you're going to be valuable and you're going to be busy because there's a lot of condo claims out there. Um, personal property, we kind of mentioned, you know, that's the stuff inside the house um, on a hail claim or a wind claim. It could be stuff in the yard, you know, and it, those, those different things that are in the yard can be subject to different part limits in the, in the policy. Um, you know, like a patio furniture, the stuff that's meant to be outside, it gets damaged, it's covered. If it's uh, somebody's riding lawnmower and it, they leave it outside and it gets rusty, you know, because it rained or they left it outside for a week and a week of rains, it's not going to be covered, right? So you have to like, for contents, they can, you still got to get into the policy to look at the at st stuff for contents claims. And generally speaking, any contents part of a claim is going to be kind of bundled up with the property claim as well because usually if you've got one you've got the other in some cases um, especially on the carrier side they may do uh, have a special like large loss contents unit where all they'll do like you go to you go to a loss as a staff adjuster which I've done and I'm handling the, the structure and I see that there's like I mean, everything in the house, inside the house that's a personal property item is damaged in some way. Or it's, you know, it needs to be cleaned or it needs to be replaced or repaired. Um, it's going to be a little bit too big for me by myself to do. So I'll hand that part of the claim off to a large loss contents unit. They'll call the homeowner and say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm the person that's going to take care of all the personal property stuff that's inside your house. Let's work together to create an inventory and then we'll get you paid for that. Right. So, and it's, 
as you can imagine, think about all the stuff that's in your house or your apartment. There's a lot of stuff, right? And there, there can't easily, it's, it's every little possible thing, pens and pencils, you know, TVs, lights, stuff that's on the wall, little rug in the, on the floor in the corner, dishes, pots and pans. I mean, everything that's in, in the chip clips, right? That's personal property. So there can, it, can, it can add up to huge long lists, even for a relatively small loss. Um, for auto, you have different types of auto claims where you just have a regular, like, you know, as an individual person, just driving my car back and forth to work and going to the grocery store and stuff, getting a car accident. Um, there's also heavy equipment. So like tractor trailers, you have RVs, you've got like construction equipment, anything that's got wheels and that can move around um, can be something that would have some sort of an auto, quote unquote, auto policy. Um, and of course, you know, there's there's also liability claims, right? So you can be an adjuster who handles only liability claims, and that is where, you know, for example, um, you have a gas station, and uh, the guy, the UPS driver, comes in to get some gas, and the, his brakes go out, or for some reason he hits the side of the the building and and it causes some damage to that, right? That's a there's a third party there. Um, that is handled differently than like a regular homeowner's claim or a commercial claim because there's, you know, somebody did it. So they've got to get recorded statements and all that kind of stuff. So those are kind of unique files. Um, and then of course you have, um, sort of like to sort of drill down on the, the role of adjuster, you have, you know, desk roles, remote roles, or whether, whether that's, you know, you're sitting at home on your couch, right, and with, on your laptop, logging into a system and reviewing files or writing estimates, or if you go to an office and sit there and review files, um, you know, you're working a call center where you're taking incoming calls or making, making first contacts uh, or setting up, you know, emergency water, you know, mitigation services or things like that. There's a, I mean, the insurance industry on our side is, is, pretty big there, and there's a lot of stuff that you can do um, as uh, a, w what I like to say is a claims professional and, and if you if you build out yourself um, you know generally people will start an auto um, and or property you can kind of do the same both at the same time um, but if you can sort of expand your skill set into, into these other areas then you'll never 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 want for work because this is, it's a huge industry. Everything's insured, right? And so the more that you can um, market yourself as somebody who can handle all these different kinds of claims, you'll be extremely busy. And speaking of desk roles, since the disease that shall not be named hit in 2020, many of the desk jobs that used to be in an office are now done almost entirely remotely. And if you ask me, this is a really big part of why so many people are moving around the country right now, or at least in the past couple of years, it's because they can, right? And because the claims industry is no different, so can you, right? You can literally live anywhere you want to with one of these roles. So if you're interested in working from home, then you need to know about the iFirm Paysetter Claim Service. They've got remote work from home opportunities. Even if you still want to work in the field, Paysetter's innovative Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover, if you go to hover.to and check that out, it will absolutely blow your mind if you've never heard of it. It is the best of the best app-based claims handling systems out there. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. Download the free guide to maximizing your productivity while working in your PJs, and also get a link to apply to Paysetter Claims Service. You can find both at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. So let's talk a little bit about um, how to get started, right? What's the path for somebody who's comes in, you know, maybe you found this video or another video on Adjuster TV and you're like, what in the world even is an adjuster? And of course, you know, I just previously, previously just basically explained kind of what we do, but how do you go from not knowing anything about policy, construction, restoration, you know, estimating software, um, all the travel, all the gear that we have to use. How do you go from that to being somebody who is making, maybe you're making, you know, six figures or close to it or a little bit over, you know, $100,000 a year um, and is, knows when you're going to have ex expectations about when you're going to be working, when you're not going to be working, you know, when your busy time is and you know when the downtime is. How do you go from complete noob to somebody who's who's, who's, it's, everything's clicked with it, with it. And this is your career. So, you know, basically you probably, 
you know, if you're watching this, you either found it somehow popped up on search or you've got a brother-in-law or an uncle or a neighbor or a, you know, your mom or somebody is an adjuster and they told you all about this job and it sounded like complete and total baloney the first time they explained it to you. So just, you decided to do a little bit of research maybe, right? So important, very, very important part of this kind of work is that you have to decide that if it's, if it's going to be something that's right for you, because it's not for everybody. And, we, and I really want you to, to be able to make an educated decision right from the start before you start spending money and using your time and your resources and everything to, to get into the work. Let's help you decide if it's really something that you want to do. Right? So the main part, the main part of what we do as independent adjusters, like I said earlier, is that we get paid by the claim, which means we have to close claims, right? So if you want to get paid for the claim that you just did, you've got to button it all up, make your calls if you have to, and then send it up, right? And the claim still, even at that point, you're not going to get paid on it until a file reviewer or a quality assurance person or whoever sees it, goes through it and says, yep, looks great. And then they send it off to the carrier. The carrier sends a check based on your estimate to the homeowner and a copy of the estimate and then sends a check to your IA firm, the person that you work through, um, which I didn't actually mention before, but as independent adjusters, we work for a, a firm, which is kind of like a temp agency. I mean, there's tons of them um, who will d- cultivate relationships with insurance companies to say, Hey, we'll be, we'll be here to provide adjusters for you if you have a big major event. Right. So, um, you're not going to get paid until the claim gets fully approved and everything goes through. Right. Um, which means that you have to have a high quality file or at least be, be on the trajectory that you are learning how to build a high quality file. It also means that you have to, um, also while you're doing that, have good customer service, right? So you have to, you have to be friendly to the homeowner. You have to treat them as though they're your grandma and you're trying to help them, you know, get their claim paid, right? Instead of trying to find ways to not pay for stuff, which is a whole other video. Um, you have to recognize that in order to do the kind of volume that you need to do in order to make six figures, a hundred thousand dollars or $80,000 or 120 or whatever it is, you have to do a lot of claims. You have to do a lot of claims. And it's not just, you're going to go work one, one hurricane, work seven days a week, work 16 hours a day for a month. And then you're going to make a hundred thousand dollars. You may have heard that that's happened and it has happened in the past, but it's extremely uncommon. If you want to make a year after year after year, you know, career out of this where you're making good money and not working too much, you, when you are on deployment and when you're handling claims, that's all you're doing. There's no, you can't multitask with this work. You can't like say, well, you know, I'm going to like, uh, I'm going to, we're going to go on a vacation down to Houston. If I get called to Houston or I get to Galveston or whatever, I'm going to take my family with me. And some days we're going to go to the beach and some days we're going to do claims. That's absolutely not going to happen. Um, it's your, your 100% full blast seven days a week, 16 plus hours a day, every day, every week for weeks on end. And if, and if you, if you get enough claims, if, if it's, if you, you go on your first deployment and you are, you've, you've gotten past the having your phone blow up every five seconds, you know, trying to do logistical things like get fuel and food, find a good hotel that's close to your claims, find your claims, figure out how to make all your phone calls, getting into the software to set things up and, and, you know, make diary entries saying that you contacted everybody. This, this, this takes time, right? Um, once you get all that stuff figured out, um, then you have to close those, you got to close those claims in order to get paid. But in order to make a living at this, you have to keep getting claims, right? So on your first ever deployment, if they give you 40 claims and that's all you get, and then you got to sit around and wait till the next, like, you know, a hurricane in, we'll say August or September, you work for a month, you get 40 claims, you close those claims and then they let you go because you d- didn't do very good or you weren't performing to the level that they, that they wanted you to, or that you needed to. And you're gonna have to wait till the next spring when the storm season starts back up again or the next big event, which is the thing that you can count on is storm season. It's not the wintertime storms or the, the freak tornado outbreak um, that you get in de- the beginning of December, that kind of thing. That's, that doesn't happen very often. Um, so ideally, the ideal s- scenario is, is that you, you get ready for everything. You know, you get all your training, get your licenses, you get your gear, you get, you get your mind right about how you, about this work. And then you 
get on your first deployment, you close claims, you get some more claims, right? So you get your first 40, you close those in like maybe two and a half weeks, maybe two weeks if you're you know, a rock star as a beginner. Um, and then you, they give you 10 more and then they give you 15 more and then they give you 27 more. As, and as you, the more you do them, the faster you're gonna get, like the beginning, you're gonna get a lot faster. You're gonna get a lot, you're gonna close claims a lot faster faster because there's so many places that you're going to instantly recognize where you can be a lot more efficient, right? So you're going to go from doing a claim in three hours to doing one in 45 minutes pretty quickly. I would say on your first storm, you should be doing that. So maybe, maybe instead of getting 40 new claims on one event, you did really well. They noticed you, you were producing, you were closing claims, you were taking, the claims are staying closed, taking care of the homeowners. And they gave you a bunch more claims and maybe you ended up with a hundred claims closed on your first event. That's a great start, right? But it's not gonna make you a hundred thousand dollars or even really that good of a living. It's it's good money, like for a short period of time, relatively speaking, but it's not a career, right? So you need to be put yourself in a position where you're gonna get more work right after that, or within a couple of within a few weeks or a few months of that, right? So if you if you if you go on a big hurricane as your first event in the middle of September and you're there until just before or just right at Thanksgiving, then you know, you might want to like lay low through, unless they send you someplace else, which they can, or they put you on, on a cleanup, which they also can, which means you stay in this, in that same place and you fix the claims that everybody else messed up. And you could be there for years on an event like that. Your next opportunity to work needs to be as soon as possible. So you need to make yourself available. And so you're always networking. You're always putting yourself out there. You're always like, like I said, expanding your skill sets so that you can have m more opportunities to work. If I haven't made it clear, there's a cycle to, you know, sort of the, the, in, the gateway drug to getting and becoming a claims professional is catastrophe property. Um, and that doesn't happen all year round, right? So it's, we'll say April, May is when, you know, most people can, can, plan on like having a hailstorm hit people who do, who do claims are going to usually be deployed, but no later than that, like the end of May, beginning of June, if it's, if it's been a slow spring and then through, you know, the end of October, that's usually, you know, April to October is, is kind of like this, the, basically the storm season, right? So in the rest of the time, nothing's going on most of the time. Um, so you need to be prepared for that and you need to be prepared to fill in that downtime with other stuff, different types of claims, da local daily claims, virtual claims, liability claims, auto claims, whatever you can get your hands on, right? Because you're, you're trying to, you know, I ideally you wanna protect your, the money that you make, your cat money, protect that money so that you're not, you know, by the time the next cat season, the next storm season starts up in the, the next spring, you're not like looking at triple digits left in your checking account and you're just praying for hail, right? That's so many people, I, I did that in the beginning um, until I kind of got the, the finance part figured out. Um, so you need to decide if, if that kind of a, like sort of feast or famine thing is, is right for you. And it's not for everybody. If you've got little kids, if you need stable income, if you need to have, you know, if you need to be able to afford to pay for, you know, higher levels of health insurance, you're gonna probably wanna get something that's a little bit more stable. Or unless you're like, you know, uh, a math whiz with personal finance, then you can figure out how to peel money off, save money aside, and and have enough set aside to where it'll ride you through until the next storm season. Which, honestly, the the, the best way to do that is to make sure that you're working in the in the off season, um, so that you don't touch that that money. Right. So. Getting started, um, if you decide, you know, that sounds great. I like to travel, I like to live in a hotel room, I like to work 16 hour days, I like seven days a week for, you know, four, two, four, six, eight, 24 weeks in a row. I'm in, 100% feast or famine. I, I'm, I'm excited about that, it's, it's good money. I, I know that I can make enough money during that time to be able to save money and cover myself, all that stuff, right? My family's not gonna mind me being away or I'll, you know, if I have an RV, I can bring them with me. If you decide that this is, this is the lifestyle for you, then you need to get ready for it, right? So basically, the, I think the very first thing that a lot of people, really that anybody should do is to get a license, right? There's really no way to prepare for a license uh, to getting a, passing a state, adjust your license exam than to get pre-licensing 
pay for pre-licensing or pre-exam prep, right? And you can get that at Adjuster Pro. If you go to adjustertv.com slash Adjuster Pro, there's a whole bunch of links in there for all the states. If you've already got a license and you need continuing education, you know, every year, every two years, depending on the state, they'll require you to reapply for your license. Um, and then you have to take training to, in order to keep the license up. It's a, it's a professional license. Um, go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro and, uh, you can, everything that you need to know about licensing is in there. Um, and then you also need to have, and I will say this about licensing. It is probably, it's, it's a really good way to kind of get a crash course in insurance when you get your when you get your home state license and you do that pre-licensing or that pre-exam prep stuff because those exams are like the basics of insurance as well as policy and it's going to be all kinds of different sorts of insurance for for most states not just property or auto generally speaking you'll get a a, a state adjuster, insurance adjuster license that will c allow you to handle property and auto claims. Um, so it's going to kind of cover all that stuff. And it's, it's a learning experience. That's for sure. Um, next up, you need to get some training, right? So I'm going to recommend hands-on training. Um, you can go to thecatinstitute.com. You can go to um, Vail Training Solutions. You can go to Mile High. You can go to Veteran Adjusting School. Um, there's there's tons of them, uh, training schools out there. The key thing that you want to get out of your 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 training at a school like this is going to be how to write a scope, how to scope a proper uh, you know a property or a structure, how to write that scope, how to uh, write an estimate based on that scope, and how to use Xactimate and or well I'd say and these days and a piece of software called Symbility. And these are the, the two pieces, main pieces of software that everybody uses for writing estimates and doing claim file management. So um, you, you need hands-on training, I think. Personally, I, I would say spend the money and go to a school to get hands-on training. Before you go to that school, though, I would also recommend learning um, how to use Xactimate and Symbility. So you're going to need a laptop. And you're going to need to install that software on your laptop, which, you know, they, they should have free trials. Um, get There's all kinds of different training that you can get. Um, if you kind of poke around on social media, you can find Stephen Harmon. He does uh, Xactimate training. Um, Alina Wilson on YouTube. She's got a bazillion YouTube train, or, uh, Xactimate training videos on YouTube, and she's got some, some training that you can buy. Um, if you go to trainwatermark.com, there's some self-paced, uh, Xactimate X1, uh, level one and level two certification training in there for a lot cheaper than everybody else, but mainly because it's self-paced. Um, I would have training on Xactimate and Symbility before I went to hands-on training so that I was, had, you already want to have a little bit of fluency and know where things are and have it installed on and working on your, your computer before you show up to training so that you're not sitting there wasting time the first day or two having the guy come over and sit down. Well, all right, here's how you, you know, here, let's get you installed or whatever. Um, so I would, you know, start with getting your license, getting exact mate and stability training, and then going to a, a hands-on five to eight day or two week or three week, you know, fails, got some three week programs um, for residential estimating, right? Remember, you, this is a job where you can make, you know, high five figures to low six figures without a college degree, without an associate's degree with, you know, three weeks worth of, you know, of formal training. I mean, why wouldn't you spend the money to do that? If you don't have the money save, you know, take a second job, you know, do what you got to do. Um, this is, you know, in deciding if this work is for you or not, it's also one of those, you got to do what you got to do in order to make things happen. If it means you got to wait a year and a half, um, and work three jobs in order to pay for this training, then I would do it. That's, that, that's just me. The work's going to be here. Um, certifications, there's a lot of different kinds of certifications that you can get for damage identification. Um, Hague education.com has a lot of, you know, material ID, damage ID. They've got, um, some, some specific training for becoming a desk adjuster under the Hague certified reviewer, um, uh, program. All those, those things are extremely important. Um, the more training that you have, the better you're going to do on that first event, which means they're going to, 
you're going to get more claims than just the, the first, you know, 20 or 40 that they give you. And then they're going to, they're going to want to keep you busy on further events, right? So that's, that's the goal, right? It's not just to have stuff, stuff to look, that's going to look good on a resume. It's to help you be successful. Um, and then you need to network once you kind of get those things in hand and you can put them on a resume. Yeah, I've got seven licenses. I'm working on seven more. I went to mile high. Um, I've got, a you know, uh, state farm carrier certification that I got at, um, a conference. Um, and now you need to network, right? So you've got some things on your resume. Let's get you meeting the people that you need to meet in order to get hired basically. And I'll tell you this, getting on a roster, getting onboarded and hired at an IA firm is not a big deal. It's not hard at all to do. You could have nothing on your resume. You could just like call and say, Hey, I want to be on, I want to, you know, do claims with none of this stuff with a phone number and an address and an email address. And they would, they would put you on their roster. They probably won't use you right away. Um, they're going to, they're going to recognize that you have zero and they're going to suggest, Hey, you need to go get training and everything else, but you can get hired by an IA firm. It's not, this is not, this is the easiest part of the whole thing, but I'm going to suggest because this is a people person job, it's a, uh, it's kind of a, it's almost, it's kind of a social job, right? Cause it's a very small industry. Everybody knows everybody else. Um, one of the biggest opportunities for networking is the national association of catastrophe adjusters conference. If you go to N A C A T A D J dot org, register for this conference, go to the conference. It's, it's more expensive than a lot of the other conferences. Some of the conferences out there are free or they're 99 bucks or 300 bucks. This one can be five, six, seven, nine hundred dollars Then depending on, you know, how early you can get your pass. Um, but it's a longer conference and you, all of those independent adjusting firms that you may have to go to and apply it individually if they have their own conferences or whatever, they're all going to be there at the same time. There's 40 or 50 IA firms that are going to be sitting there and they all, everybody has their own little booth and you get a little app um, and you say, Hey, today I want to do job interviews. And you want to interview with, you know, six IA firms. Then you, you pop in there and you make a little 15 minute appointment, take your resume or your business card or whatever. And you go sit down with them and chit chat with them, get to know them. It's 15 minutes is not a huge amount of time, but it's enough time to kind of get a, a conversation started. Um, the one of the sort of the secondary benefits of going to that particular conference is that they have a huge amount of extra training, continuing education. They've got some uh, carrier certifications, um, I believe, are happening at this one and for 2022, which is uh, next week, right? Um, if, the, if you're watching this when it, as soon as it airs, um, go to the conference. It's even if you don't have that training and stuff, I would still go to the conference because you're going to meet a lot of people and you're going to be able to network. Um, I will say that even meeting other adjusters, make an effort to meet other adjusters, you know, at the cocktail receptions and all the dinners and the lunches and the breakfasts and all that stuff that we do and sitting together in class, exchange cards with people, get to know them because a lot of the time when you, you know, somebody may get a, a call to go work a hailstorm in St. Louis and you're not getting any calls, but all of a sudden you get a text message from somebody saying, Hey, this is Joe. I, I met you at a uh, NACA and uh, the conference in Vegas. Remember when we went, you know, and did go karts or top golf or whatever. Um, so-and-so just called me and they're sending me to, to work hail claims in St. Louis. And they asked me if I knew anybody else who wanted to go. Right. So I, I thought immediately thought of you, right. So you can get work from networking with other adjusters happens all the time. You build a little network of friends. The first guy that gets called calls all his buddies. Right. And then they, everybody goes. Um, so networking is absolutely paramount. You got to have some gear, right? So you have to make an investment in, in, in gear. Laptop is a big deal. You don't need to spend for, this is my opinion. Everybody else has got their own opinion about this. I don't think you need a gaming laptop in order to run exact tomato stability. You just need, a laptop that has at least uh, the recommended specs f on these software websites that say, hey, we need your computer needs to have these things on it in order to run this software. Great. At least that. You know, if you can find a computer that exceeds those, get that because so you have a little bit of space to grow into. Um, I don't think you need a massive hard drive because this is a work computer. You're not going to be watching movies on it. You're not going to be, you know, playing video games on it. You're not going to be doing other things with this. It's a tool for work. It needs to stay with your work tools. 
Um, you need to keep it updated. You need to keep the software updated. Um, so, you know, I would, you could spend 700 bucks, you could spend 1500 bucks, but I wouldn't spend a whole lot more than that. Um, you need a printer, you need a, a couple of good ladders. You know, I've got some videos out there about different kinds of ladders, but if you have just a car, you can get a telescoping ladder um, or a 22 foot uh, folding ladder that you can stick in the trunk of most vehicles, unless you've got just like a smart car or something. If you've got a pickup truck or an SUV with a luggage rack on it, you can put a ladder rack on your pickup and you can run extension ladders. I always ran 24 foot and a 32 foot uh, aluminum extension ladders with another little shorty that I could take inside people's houses to get up in their attics if they didn't have a you know the pull down stair thing. Um, tape measures, you've got lasers, you've got a you know gear bag to carry your stuff. You know this kind of thing where you can kind of hook it into your belt and fill it up with chalk and all the little gadgets and gear and stuff that you need in order to do your a proper inspection. Snapshot camera, for some reason, those are really hard to find right now. Uh, I'm going to imagine it's probably got something to do with the supply chain problems. But if you can get your hands on one on eBay or something like that, the little Fujifilm XP140 is a great camera. It's durable. You can drop it from five or six feet and it won't break. It doesn't have any moving parts in it so that you, you know, those are the things that break first. They get chalk dust in them and, you know, a little zoom lens that pops out on a snapshot camera that you would keep in your purse, you know, or your back pocket or whatever. It's going to, those, those break. I mean, they they'll always break. I've never had, I bought those for a while. Um, and any moving piece, any part of the camera, that the little door that opens up and the lens pops out, breaks every single time, and then the camera is wrecked. Um, you need something that's water resistant or waterproof. You know, you can drop it in some water, maybe it'll float, because it's gonna get wet, it's gonna get banged up, it's gonna get dusty. You need something that's durable, right? Because um, you're gonna be outside with this camera if you're doing, you know, field work. We talked about, you know, storms. Um, and again, this, this storm season, it starts in March, April, May, and runs through October. If there's no hurricanes, runs through October, um, generally speaking. So you can count on, like I said, May to November 1st. Um, you may get a long year where you get, you know, in February, there's three or four feet of snow in Denver, right? And then they get 70 degrees. That happens there because they've got, because the, what do they call it? Uh, somebody's going to put a note in the comments, explain why places like Denver and like Calgary, Alberta will get like 70 degree beautiful weather in January and February um, and then get like four feet of snow the next day. There's a, there, I can blank on the name for why that, this sort of peculiar meteorological thing. Anyway, um, 70 degrees the next day it rains on that and so then you've got four feet of snow which is heavy gets rained on and starts to melt and that's even heavier right so then you have weight of snow losses right ice dam claims things like that um you get one of those in those last two or three weeks maybe and then by then you know maybe you get a sewer and drain backup storm in st louis in mid-march and then you get a little short break and then there's a windstorm in milwaukee in the middle of april and then you get you know the beginning of may you know, Kansas City gets smashed up or Minneapolis gets smashed up with two and a half inch hail. And then it's, you're, you could be doing that particular storm for the next two and a half, three months, a month to three or four months, just depending on, you know, depending on the number of claims, your relationship with the company that you're working with, how well you're doing, um, the long, the better you do, the longer you're going to stay on a storm. Um, and then if there's a hurricane, you know, August, September, um, then, you know, it's anybody's guess as to, you know, that's, that's a long year. And that's a year where you could, you could, you'll make well, you, you conceivably, you could make well over a hundred thousand dollars, 150, 175, um, 140, you know, something in that neighborhood. If, if you get that kind of, um, you know, a year where you're just like one storm right after the other, and you can maybe get a bunch of commercial losses in there over the summertime. And then you get a, you know, a hundred claims on a hurricane and then you do clean up on that hurricane, hurricane through like the middle of January, you're going to clear the minimum. You're going to clear a hundred thousand dollars pretty easily. Um, but that's a lot of work. It's a lot of travel. It's a lot of beating up on your gear. You're going to have to replace gear. You're going to have to replace, you know, cameras. You're going to have to replace printers because they'll break. Cause you know, you're not buying a $500 printer. You're buying a $49 printer, right? Um, stuff's going to break. You got to replace it. It gets expensive. Your vehicle's going to break down. You're going to have to get the starter replaced. You know, the alternator, things like that, that are going to, you know, four, $600,000, you know, knickknack 
sort of like nickel and diming yourself to death on those expenses. Hotels are expensive, but the amount of money that you earn is going to be well, way more than worth it for all that stuff. Storms happen when they happen. So you have to be patient and you have to recognize that, Hey, if, if my phone's not ringing right now, maybe I'm going to go play golf. Or I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to take, I'm going to, it is impromptu wake up in the morning and say, Hey, let's drive to the coast and go to the beach for, for the, a long weekend with the family. That's when you get your vacations and things. You can't say, all right, six months from now, we're going to go to Ireland for two weeks, you know, in July, it's not going to happen. You're going to be guaranteed the day before your flight. If you're not working, you're going to get calls. Hey, you want to go? We got a huge one. We need you, man. You know, we need you, you know, it's two States away, blah, blah, blah. It's great. It's great claims. It's all commercial. Then, you know, you either, then you got to decide, am I going to go to Ireland for two weeks or am I going to go make a bunch of money? Right. So you don't really, if you want to plan vacations and things like that, you got to plan them over the winter, generally speaking, uh, right after Christmas, probably the best time to do it. And you have to have, you know, a, the mindset that you're going to save money, right? So you, you're not going to go out and you're not going to buy an $87,000 F2, F Ford F250, right? You're not going to go and say, well, I'm like, Matt does an RV. Like, I'm going to do an RV too. And you, you know, it's, it's I, I suggest doing it. But the way people tend to do it is they'll say, well, Matt got an RV and I've got the resources and the guy down at the RV dealer, he's got a, you know, a manager special or a, a closeout deal. They, I'm going to tell you right now, they always have closeout deals. It's, it's $20,000 off of the list price. I'm going to tell you right now, $40,000 off the list price, you're still upside down. And at the second you pull it off the lot, guaranteed buying a brand new uh, RV, if you're going to do RVs, right? Wait, just wait, start doing claims with what you have, save money, just go get a hotel. Don't go get the nicest hotel. Um, microwave dinners, get, you know, drive throughs It's going to be you for a little while until you get your legs under, you get this figured out and, and you decide on that first storm, you know, is this really what I want to do? Do I think I can make this, you know, do I think I could enjoy this and make good money at it and help people out? You have to decide that. And before you spend a whole bunch of money on, you know, buying gear, buying trucks and things like that. That's what I would do. If, and if you have a big $100,000 a year, I would still not buy the $87,000 pickup truck. Just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do that anyway. Much as I love big pickup trucks, you don't need one. You just need a little SUV. Get a 10 or 15 year old one that you can put some money into to get it fixed up, replace the radiator, replace the water pump and the timing chain or belt, um, replace the alternator, replace the starter. Those are things that are going to go out on you. Um, do a little work on the suspension. You know, you might spend $3,000. You might spend $5,000. If you buy a little, like kind of a, I wouldn't say beater, but a, a, a gently used small SUV with a luggage rack that you can put those two ladders on and you put $5,000 into it, new tires, you know, new brakes and, and replace those other little things. It's not going to break down on you while you're on a cat deployment. You have a much, much, uh, reduced chance for equipment breakdown, right? So you have to be kind of, kind of playing ahead a little bit and thinking about these things and you have to be prepared to spend some money, right? To get started, but not on like buying fancy, like expensive things that you felt like you always deserved. Oh, I always wanted that pickup truck. And then you went and bought that pickup truck and then you have a really slow year and then you're selling that pickup truck because you can't afford the $1,100 a month payment. So it can take some time to, as you're building your career to start making, you know, how long does it take to, to make a hundred thousand dollars? Right. Um, I didn't, because I was completely, almost completely self-guided with very few sort of like mentors. Um, it took me, I would say by the, by the end of my third season, I made $114,000 that year. And that was, a, that was a long year. Um, my first year, I think I made like 25 or 30,000, uh, on a big long hail storm. <clears throat> my second year, I think it was six, about 70, 75, something like that. And then I was finally able to clear, um, a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars my third year. And then after that, you know, it, it went up, I would say, um, generally I didn't make any less than about 90,000 going forward after that until the insurance company started doing some different stuff. And then everything kind of went sideways around 20, say 2014, 2013 to 2015. Um, 
And that's what happens in this industry is things can, it's cyclical. The insurance companies, you know, use adjust, independent adjusters a lot and then they want to like not use us a lot. Right. So it can be, it can make things challenging. Right. Um, so it can take, um, if you, if you, if you, if you're just kind of like doing it the way I did it, I didn't do a hurricane until my fifth year. Um, but I was able to make a hundred thousand dollars long before that, um, if you're doing it the way I did it and just you get started on a, on a hailstorm um, and you're able to stay busy, you can, you know, if you ask James Mathis, I mean, he was making, making pretty good money more than I did my first couple of years. Um, but he also has a lot of mentors. He's very sociable. He networks a lot. He, he's on the phone all the time talking to people, which is really important. You can kind of fast track making more money by making yourself more available and being on the phone a lot. Um, so it can be, you know, right away, your first event, you can, you can make a hundred thousand dollars. If you're working on hurricane Irma or hurricane Ida, um, hurricane Katrina, if we get one of those big freak show events like that, or it can take a couple of years if things are slow and it all kind of depends on the weather and how willing you are to, um, to network, be on the phone, make yourself available and do things that you feel like you shouldn't have to do. Right. So you, you, you've got a, a kind of a service mindset. And speaking of mindsets, in a minute, I'm going to talk about what all the very best adjusters have in common. But first, facing a lawsuit as an adjuster can be a terrifying and stressful experience, which can jeopardize your years of hard work and success as an adjuster. And just to be clear, you can get an LLC um, as an IA if you really want to. And in some cases, it probably does make sense. However, you got to keep in mind that the corporate veil is called a veil for a reason. It's not a wall. It's not a door. It's nothing. It's not solid. You can poke your finger right through it. So there's a much better way to protect yourself if you are deposed or sued as an adjuster. And that is what e &O, also known as errors and emission insurance, is for. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you've got to get errors and emissions, and general liability insurance coverage. doesn't matter if you're W-2 or 1099, or even if you work carrier direct um, as an IA, you've got to protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the free insurance for adjusters guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And again, that's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. So what do all the best adjusters who, who are working and who are, you know, being called all the time, who've got this down, it's their career, they're make, they, they know how much money they're going to make every single year from doing this. What do those people all have in common? I think that they've got a good, you know, sort of a similar mindset and it's primarily a willingness to serve, to be of service um, and a willingness to go ab above and beyond. So as far as a willingness to serve, this means that you're thinking beyond yourself, right? So in other words, you're, you're saying, I can do this, this career and make really great money for me and my family. Um, and so I'm gonna put myself first, right? So I'm gonna just do things that's gonna f move the ball only for that, right? Um, that's kind of a sort of a, you're serving yourself sort of a kind of a mindset, right? If you're, if you're having a willingness to be of service to others, then you're saying I'm here to help my IA firms, um, help their customers, which are the insurance companies who are going to help their customers, which is the, the customer, the customer, the insured, right? If they need me to do, to, to do something that sounds like a big pain in the rear end, or it's going to be low paying, um, for the, all the work that I'm going to have to do for it, or it's going to be a long drive, right? If I have to drive 250 miles round trip to do this claim, and it's just one claim and it's not going to pay very well and they can't pay for mileage, I'm going to still do it, right? Because I'm going to say, you know what? The person on the other end of that call who is calling me to ask me if I want to take that claim, and he knows. I may not be the first person that, that he called and he may be, under the gun himself, he may be under a lot of pressure. This is something that they have to, that the IA firm who's calling me has to do in order to keep their carrier client, who's going to be responsible for giving me other work. He's under pressure um, from them to get this claim handled, right? Maybe it's a, an insured that is, has a lot of policies and has been with the company for a very long time and they want to take care of that person. Um, the manager who calls me and asks me to do that may have called 
you know, two or three or four or five or six or other people who all declined th that particular claim because of too far away. You know, if you're not going to pay mileage, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it because of, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, or being basically bitchy about it. If, if he calls me and says, hey, Matt, I got one, you know, it's, I, I know this is not a great one and, and I, I apologize for this and we'll try to, you know, help you out some, some other way, but it's 250 miles one way and uh, it's a, the homeowners, there's a public adjuster there. It's going to be a big nightmare of a claim, right? And it happens sometimes. You get like these, the claim that's just like a perfect storm, a rogue wave of just all the, the worst things that can happen. Hey, no problem. I'll take care of it. Just send it over and I'll, uh, I'll get them called and I'll get them scheduled in the next couple of days, right? Do that. You just took 10,000 pounds of weight off of that manager's shoulders who was calling you, your firm. He's going to remember that, right? So, so in a way, having a willingness to, to a, 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 like a service mindset still serves you, you know, as, as the person who's like, you know, what is looking out for yourself because it's not something that's going to like, necessarily reward you right away but in the long run it absolutely is going to because you're going to build a you're going to build a reputation as somebody who's willing who's there to help they know that they can count on you when everybody else says no right and that that is worth something in any in any job in any career that i can think of in any endeavor um which is you know a, a part and parcel of going above and beyond um, this means that you're not doing the minimum on the claim just to get it closed so you can get paid on it it's making sure that that claim looks like, um, you know, the claim that you would put together for your mom, right? If you're, if you're at her, at her house, um, you want to take care of that customer, um, go above and beyond your, your, your professionalism, the way you handle yourself, the way you dress, the cleanliness of your vehicle when you show up, even if it's not like a brand new car or whatever, you can keep it clean. And, you know, maybe if you, if it's got some rust on it, take a little bit of that money, your startup money and paint that car, right? Just so that it looks okay sitting down there at the end of the street, you know, at the end of the driveway. Having a willingness to go above and beyond um, is extremely important with this work. And you could still be fast and you could still make a lot of, of money and, and turn over a lot of claims and have a high volume, uh, fast cycle time and still be a really, really, have a really high quality, high end professional product, work product on your file, the way your file looks and your customer service, right? Um, I think that adjusters who are who really crush it at this work are also s students, right? They're willing to to adapt and to grow and and to build their skill set. If some new technology comes along, they're not like throwing their hands up in the air and jumping on social media and calling everybody names and say, "Oh, this is the you know the end is nigh, sky is falling, chicken little kind of thing," which I see often. Um, they're willing to say, hey, well, let me assess that tool and see if it's something I can fit into my workflow or how is it going to fit into my workflow and how can, I, how can I minimize its impact on my efficiency? How can I use that tool you know, or that workflow or whatever it is that they want me to do to make myself faster, right? Um, I can tell you that when I first started doing claims back in 99, we had a paper file right we took we had big old polaroid camera and you took polaroid pictures of hail damage and everything and you had that thing around your neck and you pulled the picture out and you wrote down on the on the, the little white part at the bottom the, la the label that was your photo labeling right and you stick it in your pocket and then you had to hand write the diary entry you, you still used exactimate i wasn't like so far back that it was handwriting everything but i used exactimate so i print out an estimate print out several copies of the estimate put it all into the file um and write checks, had to fill out a register for the check, for the, the checkbook, you know, and keep track of all that stuff. Uh, damage, you know, evaluation sheet, diagrams, I mean, the whole nine yards. And then you had to fill out stuff on the file jacket. It's a lot of stuff to do. And I could still do a claim. Once I figured out how to do all that stuff quickly and I, had, I knew what was going to, I was exactly what I was going to do next. It was like driving a stick shift, right? It was first gear, second gear, third, fourth, fifth. You're doing you know, everything in a sequence over and over and over again. And you start to find that you're, you're able to do everything really fast um, and, and keep your quality level up. So it's no different back then than it is now. They want you to use settle assist. They want you to switch from exactimate to stability. Just figure it out, right? So an adjuster, it's, it is what it is. If that's what they want you to use, then we're there to serve them. Um, and, and if I want to do be an adjuster, I got to do it. So I have to have a, a willingness to grow and adapt and do it with a smile and be happy. You know, something's changing. All right, let's, let's 
see what this new thing is. Maybe I can be faster, right? I would say also that their adjusters, most successful adjusters are a little ambitious. They don't want to kind of like lock themselves into a role and just stay there for the whole career. Um, because, you know, you can do, certainly do that. You can be like the best of the best cat property adjuster, the best of the best condo adjuster or whatever. Um, but again, like I said earlier, if you diversify your skill set and you become like, you know, you make yourself a claims professional, you're never going to um, be looking for work. It's, th there's always going to be something for you to do. And the people who are, you know, you can find yourself retiring from the field and retiring from doing claims into a management role, which can bring, put you into an executive role or starting your own IA firm. And, th and those the sky's the limit with some of that stuff, right? So it's, you're not just like 25 years later, you're still an adjuster. 25 years later, you are running, you're the president of an IA firm, right? And a lot of people that you meet at NACA um, and that you meet at Crawford's Cat Con, Mid-America Cats Conference, um, Paysetter meet and greets, the people that go to those things, Eberl, their roadshow stuff, those are people who used to be adjusters who are now owners of companies or they're, they're vice presidents of you know operations or marketing or human resources or whatever. And so they've got executive level roles and they're the ones that are, that are guiding the industry. Um, so be ambitious, I think. I mean, you don't have to be, but it's, I, I, I don't know why, for me, in my mind, I don't know why you wouldn't be. Um, and again, professionalism, you know, we talked about this a little bit. You gotta leave your ego at home. If somebody disagrees with something that you say, you're not going to take it personally, like anything, just don't take anything personally. Right. Um, people who are, have the highest levels of professionalism tend to listen more than they talk. Right. So you're, you're getting information from people when you let them just talk. Right. So the homeowner, if they're having, if they're, they're going to rant about something, they're upset because maybe when they call the claim in, they didn't get something, they, the ball got dropped somewhere. Let them talk, let them tell you everything that's wrong. And then that way you have, you're not, you're not like tell, talk, talking at them and just not, it's harder to, to, to provide a good customer service experience for somebody if you are the one who's doing all the talking all the time, right? So you want to be listening, right? And it's, it goes for your marriage too. I'm just saying, always on time. Even if you're going to find yourself, you're going to be late. You know, you're going to be late call. Even if you're, if, if it's a half an hour before your appointment and you're going to be 15 minutes late, I'm going to call or text and say, Hey, we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to meet you there in a half an hour. I just want to let you know I'm about 15 minutes behind schedule because I hit some tra traffic or construction or there was an accident on the highway or my previous one's going over, going along or whatever. If it's five hours beforehand and your, your schedule starts getting wrecked from, you know, the very first appointment and you've got a four o'clock appointment and you know, you're not going to be able to get there until five. I'm calling that person. I'm calling everybody, you know, that I think if I'm think I'm going to be late, calling every single person and saying, Hey, we've got an appointment today at five, four o'clock. Um, things are going sideways in my schedule. Um, I won't be able to get there until five. I want to make sure that was okay with you. And if not, we can reschedule or whatever. 99.999% of the time that call lasts 30 seconds. And they say, Oh no, that's fine. It's totally fine. We'll be here. We'll see you at five. Right. I'll just, I'll call the contractor and he'll, I'll just let him know to wait or whatever, right? Thank you so much for calling. 100% of the time, no matter how grumpy they've ever been with me, how nice or whatever, if they were mad at me for some reason, they will always say, thank you so much for calling and letting me know. That is probably the number one customer service trick for doing this job and really doing anything, if you ask me. Um, and again, you know, professionalism means serving the customer for yourself. And I take that several steps further and I say, you know, the customer, the insurer is not just the customer, right? Everybody in the whole process that I will come in contact with is the customer. The contractor that's there, the roofer, the public adjuster, even if they're jerks, they're the customer. I'm going to treat them with, I'm going to use customer service on them, right? I'm going to treat them with dignity and respect. And you'll find that somebody who's expecting a fight is going to put their dukes up and kind of punch at you a little bit when you first get there. Figuratively speaking, if you're like, totally professional, you don't take that personally, you're not rising up to that and punching back, then they will, 98% of the time, they're going to back down and they're going to be like, hey man, listen, you know, I'm sorry, I just came from one and, and the guy, you know, he, he yelled at me and he took, he pulled the ladder down and left me up on the roof and I, I'm sorry I got mad at you, you know, at the, at, when we first started to, you know, I appreciate your, your professionalism. And that happens as well, right? You can't control other people, what other people do. You can only control what you do. Adjusters who are, do really well at this, um, you'll hear about this, they're very organized and they're very efficient. And 
organization and efficiency is something that some people will say can't be taught. I'm living proof that it can be taught. You have to ha- you have to have these skills, and a lot of this comes from seeing the claims process multiple times, right? So repetition. So if if you haven't handled claims yet, you need to try and figure out a way to practice the claims process. The way I tell people to do it, get a free, you know, Xactimate subscription, um, take some training for Xactimate so you know where everything is, and then practice scoping a very small loss at your house, right? I want to replace the trim on the door um, downstairs in this room, right? And maybe the baseboard around the base because I'm going to pretend like it had water damage to it. Take pictures of it, just like you're doing a claim. So you can take a risk photo outside. You know, you might walk around the house and pretend like you're, you know, get some four corner shots. And then you go inside to that room, get your overview shots, get shots of where you're pretending like where the damage is, you know, get a couple of shots, close up showing the quality of the baseboard. Important label those photos and exact to stability. Write an estimate, write a short activity diary entry that says scoped loss, found damage to da da da, caused by blah, 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 explain such and such, and such to the insured. Maybe if you've got, you can get your hands on a template, a GLR template, which we've got at adjustertvplus.com. Um, do a GLR, a general loss report or a narrative or something like that. And then that should take you, like for the very first time you ever do it, it might take you two hours to do that. But within a few days, it should take you 10 minutes to do that, right? So, and, and, if, and as you, ha- you do little scenarios like that, the next scenario, you're pretending there's a water spot on the ceiling, write a little repair estimate, paint, drywall, insulation, whatever. Um, same deal, import label photos, write a, uh, build a sketch and you know, a diagram and sketch with the measurements and everything. And just start seeing the process. The more repetition that you have, um, the more experience you have, the more places you're going to be, start to see where you, you need to be fully organized and where you can build efficiencies into what you do. And if efficiency, all that is, is taking a, a particular task and having it take the, the shortest amount of time that it, it can take um, without wasting moves, right? So in other words, if you're importing and labeling photos, you've got a, a, a streamlined process, you know where your cable is or you know where the slot is for your SD card, you know how to get them into the to the computer. You know how to get them from the card into Xactimate. How to bulk label things, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you, you instead of like labeling each indiv- individual picture, if you've got a bunch of similar ones or they're all the inside of one, you know, the same room. There's 12 of them. Then you can bulk label the image name as bedroom upstairs bedroom. Right. And then you can put in a description of what each individual thing is. Here's an overview shot of the corner. Here's a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can build those efficiencies in. Um, and the more you do the claims, the, the faster you're going to be just naturally. But if you've got kind of a mind for it and you're looking for those efficiencies, you're timing yourself doing certain things, um, the faster you're going to be. Right. And that's what I, that's what I did. And that was one of the fun things for me because I get, you get paid per claim. I wanted to do as many claims as possible during the day, but I also recognized that if I sucked, if my claims were messy and just thrown together, that I wasn't going to get more claims or more deployment. So I tried to do as the best job I could on the claims while being as fast as possible. And that's, you know, that's how I made a 20 year career out of it. And, you know, did pretty well for myself. Um, and you know, it kind of as a as a part of that is that you have to kind of have to treat this as a as a business and as a less like a career. So in other words, you've got you have to make plans, right? You have to understand that there's sales involved, right? So you know, your your sales and marketing is your networking, is your it's it's you doing that that crappy two hundred fifty mile one way round, you know, claim that nobody else wants to do. That's part of your sales, right? That's part of your that's part of your sort of what becomes your brand, right? You're the person, you're the go-to person that's going to help um, help them, which breeds reciprocity. I've seen it happen thousands of times, um, which means that you go do that claim and you do that a few times. You're not going to do that all the time. They're not going to beat you up with them. Um, they're going to think of you first when they get 77, you know, uh, a commercial group with 77 buildings in it and that's all they want you to do. Hey, can you drive, you know, three hours away? It's, they're all one story apartment buildings and they're all like 250 squares each. Uh, it's, there's 77 of them. You get the bill for each building, right? So you, you rewrite an indiv- individual claim, even though they're all under the same blanket policy, 77 individual claims, commercial claims. And you're going to, it's going to be a huge payday for you. You're going to make more in that week than you will in a month doing regular claims, right? They're going to give you those. They're going to think of you first on those. Hey, Matt, you want to go you know, drive up to Minneapolis and take care of those claims? Heck yes, I do. I'll, uh, I'll get them taken care of and then 
you know, we'll move on down the road. Um, so you've got to have kind of, you have to plan for that kind of thing in your sales and marketing. You have to, to kind of look at your year, um, as far as your finances and your like personal accounting for money goes, right? You're making a bunch of money, you know, in, in the, there's a big hump of money in the middle of the year during storm season. And then if you don't do cat work in the off season or you don't do anything, then there's zero income and you're spending that money that you earned. Right. So you have to have a plan to set money aside and a plan for making money in the off season. The great thing about these days is that you can do stuff that you pick up on the app. You know, I'm now active as an Uber Eats driver, right? So I'm gonna like just start taking Uber Eats jobs the second I get home. I'm gonna take two days off and then I'm gonna drive around, do Uber Eats for, you know, three or four or five days a week just to make enough money to cover rent or, you know, your mortgage or whatever it is, right? Um, at, or and there's a bunch of different kinds of work you can do. You can you can do that with auto claims. You can do that with property claims. You can do that with all kinds of stuff. The remote stuff, the file review stuff. Um, always be doing something. Always be protecting that that money that you make. Um, so you have to have kind of a long term plan for how much money you want to save because you're not going to want to do this forever, right? So maybe you want to have like a plan for saving back enough money to pay off the house and sock back enough a bunch of money in your 401k or your IRA and then bail, right? Buy a motorhome and travel the country or whatever you want to do, right? So maybe have an end game that you're thinking of. Um, all of these things um, kind of depend on, you know, as you build your career and you, you want to make, you know, earn more and have more responsibilities and more challenges in, in this particular kind of work, you have to ha kind of have that continuous improvement mindset. You're adaptable, you're willing to serve. Um, you've got short and long-term plans for growth and advancement. You're not just day by day letting things happen to you you're being proactive you're being you're a little bit ambitious you know you're taking the long view on things you're 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 not taking like you know instant um gratification things over something that that may not reward you for a while for uh, you know days weeks or possibly decades right so in other words saving your money Right. Instead of buying a fancy, big, fancy pickup truck, when you go to cat orientation on a hurricane, the parking lot's going to be full of eighty to hundred thousand dollar pickup trucks. It just is. I don't know why. I don't know why. Was, I did it. But, you know, to be honest with you, only back when I did it, they weren't hundred thousand dollar pickup trucks. They were fifty five thousand dollar pickup trucks. Um, so everything's gotten more expensive. No, there's no point in spending that much money on a truck. Um, even if you're pulling a trailer with it, which is what I did. So we say it all the time, you know, this, this career is not rocket surgery. You don't need a four year degree. You don't really even need any experience to get started. But in spite of all that, you're going to increase your odds of getting your first deployment and getting more deployments and daily work after that by being fully prepared from the start. You've got a couple of options. You can follow the random advice from your cousin's uncle who sometimes goes on property deployments, or you can listen to the loudest random know-it-alls on social media who may or may not actually know what they're talking about, or you can listen to the people who will actually hire you. The good news is that Adjuster TV is built around getting you up to date and accurate information for getting going as an IA and ultimately crushing it in this amazing and lucrative career. So I have a question for you. This is a question we asked at the beginning. Have you ever wished you could prove to IA firms that you understand policy, construction, Xactimate, and customer service? Have you ever wished you could show them that you have a good quality ladder, a quality laptop, and other gear, and that you have the most desirable and current adjuster licenses, carrier certifications, and hands-on training, even that you're bilingual, which is extremely valuable in this business, by the way? Well, myself and Chris Stanley from IAPath.com put our heads together to solve this problem once and for all, which is why we're proud to announce Adjuster Score. Adjuster Score will test you, the adjuster, on your knowledge of claims, including policy, exactimate stability, construction, customer service, and so on, inside of a secure, fully proctored environment, which is important because it means that the major IA firms, including Eberles, Pilot, Sedgwick, Crawford, The Best Claims, House & Company, Pace Setter, and so many more, all trust this score as an accurate representation of what you know. So just because you don't have any claims experience doesn't mean that you can't get work and prove that you know something about how to do this work. Kind of think of adjuster score in this way. It's like an SAT score or a credit rating, right? So your total aggregate score 
Inside your adjuster score profile will include not only your test scores, but you will also be able to gain points from what gear that you have, including, like I said, your ladders, laptop, camera, etc., so that the IA firms that you apply to can see that you have the gear you need to go to work right now. Because so many adjusters show up to big cat events with no gear at all because, the, and they say, well, I didn't know I was supposed to, I didn't know I was going to be climbing roofs. You're going to know, and you're going to know what gear you need in order to, do, in order to be ready to hit the ground running. You can also upload proof of your current light adjuster licenses, carrier certifications, damage ID certifications from Hague, et cetera, and any in-person training that you've received from places like Voss, Vail, Caddy, Mile High, and so on. All of these things will gain you points and show up in your searchable profile. Your profile will have a unique web address so that you can email it to HR recruiters, put it on your business card, put it on your resume. If you've got it, you know, a little website as an adjuster, you can put it on there. And the firms are using adjuster score as well to search for people who have your skills and your gear. Adjuster score is fully supported by the independent insurance claims industry as the standard for adjuster competency and readiness. Get your free adjuster score profile started right now by signing up at adjusterscore.com. This is a big deal and we have the complete and total support of the major IA firms. In fact, they even helped us shape adjuster score so that you would know what's important and what's not important and what to do at every step of the way as you become a successful insurance adjuster. Adjusterscore.com. Well, that does it for me. If you found value in this video, subscribe and hit the old like button so that you never miss a new video from Adjuster TV. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm. This is Adjuster TV.